From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, no. <laughs> How are you, boy? Terrible. Goodbye. Huh? Johnny, what's the matter? Well, the last one you handed me was that phony spiritualist case, and it's still haunting me. <laughs> Before that, it was Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Oh, you made money on him, didn't you? Yeah. I nearly lost my mind. Well, all right. I've got one for you now that'll surely make you lose your mind. Johnny, come on over, huh? Uh, okay. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Lakeside Life and Casualty Insurance Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. Expense account item one, 80 cents. Cab fare from my apartment at the office of Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Every one of the cases Pat had handed me lately had been rough. And if it weren't for the loot involved, which is to say Pat never really cracked down on my expense accounts, well, after all, I didn't have any other cases pending, so... Hi, Johnny. Hey, you're looking great. <laughs> Sit down, huh? Cigarette? Or would you like a drink? Well, how are you, boy? <sighs> okay, Pat, let's have it. This one must really be bad. Why, Johnny, what makes you say a thing like that? You sure you wouldn't like just one little one? No, before, no, huh? no, 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 mm-hmm. thanks. Right. Now, come on, let's get to the point. What are you trying to get out of paying off on this time? <laughs> you want the truth, Johnny? Nothing. Nothing at all. Just a favor for a friend of mine down in New York. Yeah, who? I want you to go down and see Peter Branson. Branson? Any relation to that worry ward Harry Branson of Philly Mutual? Well, his brother. Whoops! Get uh, yourself uh, uh, another boy, no, Pat. No, no, Johnny, Johnny, he's as different from Harry as day is from night. Well, he better be. That literal minded stick in the mud Harry nearly drove me crazy on those two cases I handled for him. Pete is different as day is from night, honest. Now, will you see him? Expense account item two, 21 even, train fare and all the incidentals I could think of, Hartford to New York. Item three, 55 cents, taxi from Grand Central to Peter Branson's Lakeside Life and Casualty offices at 505th Avenue, where my worst fears were justified. That is correct, Mr. Dollar. I am not only Harry's brother. Don't tell me. You're his twin. Why, yes. How could you have guessed it? Oh, but now, wait a minute. Did you say you took a taxi for the three blocks over from the station? Yep. At least that's what goes on the expense account. Oh, dear, my brother was right. You are expensive, and yet he seems to have the utmost confidence in your abilities. Yeah, but now I... The amazing way in which you settled that case... Harry, uh, Pete. Yes? What's the case that's bothering you? Isn't that interesting? I don't know yet. Tell me about it. I mean, you're starting to call me Harry because of my twin. Oh, yeah. Better tell me about the case. You know, a great many of our mutual friends... What? Oh, Oh, yes, of course. Michael Jeremiah Flynn, a terribly serious matter. If this sort of thing ever gets out of hand... Who's Flynn? John, he is a bum. Aren't we all? A regular, typical, movie-type version of a Bowery bum. So? And unfortunately, he holds a $50,000 policy. Well, he must have seen better days to carry that much insurance. Never. Never, I'm sure of it. No human being could degenerate to such a state in a mere 47 years. And he looks and sounds like 67. Also, by the way, his policy is only two months old. Well, what's happened? Somebody knocked him off? No, but I am sure somebody's going to. Well, then why did you insure him? It was Martha who was really responsible. Who's she? Martha Ingersoll, the girl I had working for me here in the office at the time he applied for the policy. I was out sick for a couple of weeks, and I'm afraid that when I came back, I did not pay sufficient attention to the application she'd accepted. At least so far as Flynn's policy is concerned. You better tell me about it. Oh, of course, he passed his medical all right, though heaven knows how. And his cash payment of the premium was all right. Yes, yes, cash. But I still should have investigated myself before allowing the policy to be issued. Look, you still haven't told me what's wrong. Now, of course, it's too late. Pete. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, of course. Well, it's simply this. The home address that we have for him has turned out to be the Glad Hand Rescue Mission just off Fulton Street near the Fulton Market. Yeah, biggest fish market in the world, isn't it? Well, yes, yes. A fascinating place. Chips loaded with fish from all the seven seas. Colorful characters speaking a dozen different tongues. Yeah, well, uh, I'm sorry I interrupted what you were saying about Oh, that's all right. That's all right. I'm quite a connoisseur of seafood, you know. Real epicure, if I do say so. Have you ever tasted Boston Scrod? Yeah, sure. Uh, Now, let's get back to the case. Oh, oh, yes, Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn, that's right. 
Well, Mr. Dollar, John, it's simply because of what's happened before that I'm so worried about this one. After all, 50,000 is a sizable policy. And what has happened before? The same thing. So you can see. Harry, uh, Pete, I can't see a thing. John, it's like the Angus Cormac matter back in 47, like the old Mother McCrary affair that happened. Trying to tie Peter Branson down to the facts of the case was exactly like trying to tie his brother Harry down, only more so. I had to keep reminding myself that all of Harry's assignments had paid off handsomely for me and keep hoping the same would be true of his brother. Three separate times in the next 15 minutes, Pete launched forth on the Epicurean delights of seafood. And three times I vainly tried to steer him back to port. Finally, I threatened to walk out on him unless he got down to business. All right. All right, John, I'll give it to you in black and white. Oh, not literally, of course. I mean, I'll tell you from the beginning. boy. Now... Four times within the past few years, this very same sort of policy has been issued. To some penniless, worthless bum. Yes, and everything has indicated fraud. How do you mean? In only one case, were the police able to prove anything, the case of Maggie Dolly Varden Smith. Oh, yeah, seems to me I remember that. Some racketeer ex-bootlegger. Correct, Candy Kid Schultz. Yeah, he insured the old derelict for twenty, thirty thousand dollars had himself named beneficiary. That is correct, and then he had old Maggie murdered. Of course you remember. And you think you've got the same sort of a situation here? Yes, John, I'm afraid so. And you can't cancel the policy unless there's proof of an attempt at fraud. Correct. So you can see why I'm so deeply concerned over this. Oh, if only I hadn't left Martha Ingersoll in charge while I was sick. Who's named as beneficiary in the policy? Well, she did sell some good policies. What? Hmm? Beneficiary. Oh, yes. Uh, here, here it is. Uh, John Wesley Cosgrave, 621 East 49th Street here in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. What do you know about him? Nothing, really. And frankly, I'm afraid to find out. John? Yeah, yeah, I'll look into it. And what's the address of this rescue mission where old Michael hangs out? It's down near the big Fulton Fish Market. Uh, let me see. Here, why don't you give me that whole folder so I can get what I want from it? Of course, John. But I am sorely afraid there isn't much to get. I'm sorely afraid Peter was right. Why not I had to start somewhere? Item 4280, taxi back to Grand Central to pick up the bags I'd parked there and the same taxi to a slightly dingy little hotel a couple of blocks off Chambers Street on the Lower East Side. Item 5, $9.83 to a second-hand clothing store where I outfitted myself in hat, coat, pants, shirt, shoes, and socks that I hoped would make me eligible for a spot on a bench at the Glad Hand Rescue Mission. When I finally shuffled into the place, which looked more like a cheap flop house than a mission... I felt somewhat like a kid playing tramp at Halloween. Welcome, brother. Welcome to the mission. I'm Daddy Bill. Hi. The entrance to the soup kitchen is over at the side, you know. Yeah, well, I I just want to sit down for a spell, rest my feet. And have you a bed for the night, brother? Oh, who knows? I'll make out. Well, there's always room for one more, you know. Will you be here for our meeting tonight? Well, uh, I don't know. You have an excellent singing voice, I can tell. Are you sure you don't want something to eat, my boy? No, no, I'm all right. Well, then, just sit and be comfortable and we can talk. I, uh, I kind of hope maybe I might run into Mike. Mike? Flynn. Oh, yes, of course. Michael lives here. Spends most of his evenings with us, poor fellow. Although I really shouldn't say that. Huh? Say what? But poor fellow. After all, he's also one of our biggest contributors, too, when he's sober. Although where his money comes from, I'll never know. Yeah, well... Although I'm sure it's money honestly gained. Michael's very religious. He's taken the pledge many times, many. Has a lot of money now and then, huh? Yes. He seemed to think he might have a contribution for us when he comes back tonight. But you don't know where he gets it. My boy, I never ask these personal things of the brothers. Now, tell me all about you. You're from out of town, aren't you? I can tell. This was something I hadn't anticipated, and I had to rack my brain to come up with a story that would convince Daddy Bill I was a bum. When I could get a word in edgewise, that is... And a kindly, gabby old biddy proceeded to tell me in minute detail the life history of all of the habitués of his mission. All, that is, except the one I was interested in, Mike Flynn. Maybe he was suspicious of me, afraid I might be trying to get my hands on some of the money old Mike frequently showed up with. Generous in the extreme, John. That's why I feel I must protect him from some of the people who come in here and might try to take advantage of him. Sure, Daddy, the you're right. responsibility for the care and welfare of the brothers weighs heavily upon me sometimes, but it's a burden I'm glad to bear. Yeah, well, i Feed I'm... their stomachs and feed their souls. That is my task. You say you think... And you're... as I say, it's a task I'm privileged to assume. After all, whom else have they to lean on? You think Michael will be back here tonight? Oh, yes, John, I'm sure he will. 
Oh, but listen. Hmm? The quartet in the, uh, well, we call it in the music room. Can you hear them? Oh, yeah. Yes. They're getting ready for the meeting tonight. Aren't they wonderful? Beautiful voices. Yeah, they ain't bad at that. You sure you won't join them? Oh, no, I, uh, <clears throat> some other time, huh? Now, when well, whatever like... you say, but if you're going to stay here long, my boy, with that wonderful voice of yours, I can tell. I will insist that you join one of our singing groups. Yeah, Bob Mike again. Oh, you... dear, did you hear that? Someone hit a sound note. Poor boys, they just can't get along without my help. You'll just have to excuse me, John, mm. while I go back there and lead for them. I'll come back later. We'll talk. I don't know whether it was the overuse of steam heat in the battered old assembly hall of the mission or having listened to two solid hours of Daddy Bill's talk about his boys. Whatever it was, I was tired. And since I had nothing better to do than wait for Mike Flynn to show up, I, I stretched out on one of the hard benches and closed my eyes. <sighs> How long I slept, I haven't the least idea. I'd managed to conjure up a mighty sweet dream, too. Bill! What? Daddy, Bill! What? What? Uh... Where, where oh. Bill? Oh, there. Oh, hold it, fella. Hey, you've had a couple too many. Yes, I guess I had a... Bill! Oh, he's out back working with a quartet now. Come on over here and lie down. Uh, yes, I guess old Michael... Michael? <laughs> Michael Jeremiah Flynn, sir. Mike. And I guess... I guess... I guess I have had a couple... A couple too many was right, but not of what I'd thought. His tattered coat opened as he fell, and there, just below the heart, two dark red splotches slowly widened on his ragged shirt. And it looked like Peter Branson was right. The beneficiary of Michael Jeremiah Flynn's life insurance policy was anxious to collect. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, tomorrow there's proof that life is a very tenacious thing, even in the broken body of a Bowery bum. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this message I found when I came in... Yeah, Pete, somebody took a couple of shots at your $50,000 client, Mike Flynn. Well, is he... Will he die? From the looks of things last night, he may pull through in spite of the two slugs in him. I hope so. Do you know who did it? No idea, but I'm going to try to talk to him. Have you talked to the beneficiary? Not yet. First, I want whatever information I can get from Mike, if he's still alive. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York, New York. Attention, Peter Branson, Lakeside Life and Casualty Insurance Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. Expense account item six, 55 cents. Taxi to the neighborhood of the Glad Hand Rescue Mission, where Daddy Bill, a general factotum, had promised to take the best of care of Michael Jeremiah Flynn. He'd given Mike a room to himself on the second floor, and what a room. What wallpaper was left hung in shreds from the cracked plaster. The shades on the dirty windows were tattered and torn. A single bare fly speck light bulb hung on a cord from the ceiling. The floor was bare, and the only furniture was a battered chest of drawers, an ancient washstand with a cracked pitcher and bowl, and a sagging iron bed on which old Mike Flynn lay. Come in. Come in here. Hi. Well, you must be the man who helped me into the mission last night. Yeah, yeah. My name's Johnny Dollar. Come up to see how you're making out. Well, I'm much obliged to you, Johnny. I'm real obliged to you. Well, how are you feeling this morning? Me? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I've never felt better. <laughs> sit down. Sit down. Well, what did the doctor that Daddy Bill got for you have to say? The doctor for me? Oh, now, Johnny, you must be joking. <laughs> joking? After you had a couple of slugs tear through you? 
Here, let me help you. Oh, you want to see him? Sure, sure. Now, wait a minute. Now, just look for yourself here. Ah, you see? See? They just went through my side here, in the front, and out the back. Holy. Oh, see, aren't they healing up nicely? Why, that one couldn't have missed your heart by more than three inches. But it did. <laughs> yes, it did. Not nearly so close as this scar, though. What? Want to see this scar? Look at it right here. Hey, was that a bullet wound, too? No, no, oh, no, Johnny. That was just an old ice pick or something. Huh? Somebody in the crowd drew that fire down at the battery line. Oh, wasn't that a beautiful fire, Johnny? Did you see that? Oh, but what did these slugs do to you inside? Oh, you must be... To me? Oh, not a thing. Well, I'm so durable. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say there was another attempt on your life last week? No, 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 of course not. Just an accident like those shots last night. You think that was an accident? <clears> huh? <throat> Why, don't you? Do you know who fired them? Oh, John, I haven't the least idea. Well, no. Where did it happen? I was right here in the mission, and I didn't hear any shots. Oh, dear, no. I was down near my private place. Where's that? <sighs> Where's that, Mike? Well, I'll tell you, Johnny. It's this way. Daddy Bill and the others here at the mission are real nice to me. Oh, they're real nice you can see by this lovely private room that they fixed up for me. Uh, yeah. yeah. And they'd like for me to stay here all the time. I guess Daddy Bill thinks if I'm here most of the time, I might not drink so much and keep getting into those kind of... Scr- Say, do you ever enjoy a little drink, Johnny? Well, on occasion. But you were going to tell yes, me... Here. Oh, here. Now, I've got a little bottle tucked under the mattress here, Sam. Ah, ah, here it is. <laughs> well, what under the sun is that? That, that? that color, that pink? Yeah, that's my favorite, that pink. Straight whiskey costs so much. Even when I have the money now and then. You know something? I like a little bit more kick in mine. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a hangover from the Prohibition days. <laughs> so I mix a little kick into it. Here, Johnny, I want you to try this. Well, I... Uh, that yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, you like this. Oh, oh what a wallop. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what the sap, Ellen? Yes, what that sterno. Oh. That's what I add to it, just a little <laughs> bit of sterno. <laughs> Mike, this stuff will kill you. Oh, I've been drinking that for years. Look at me, the picture of health. Oh, mm, Mike, just take a little sip. Mm. I'm going to get ah. you a doctor. <laughs> no, no, you're not. I won't stand for but it. But you've been shot. Oh, no. Just gave me a little twinge or two last night, but now I feel fine. Well, you fell flat on your face when you came in here. Oh, now listen, Johnny. Don't you tell Daddy Bill, but I'm afraid it wasn't the bullets last night. It was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Overindulgence. Oh, brother, I give up. <laughs> no, no, don't say that, Johnny. <laughs> oh, all right, then how did it happen? Well, I was on my way back here when the car drove by. Oh? Yeah, it sounded to me like a couple of backfires or two, but <laughs> then I felt this little uh, sting on my side, and that's it. And you call that an accident? Well, of course, the men in the car were probably just having a little friendly argument. How many men? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I think there were only two of them. I waved at them. What kind of a car? Black. But what make, could you tell? Well, it was shiny and it was new. See, I wish I had a car, Johnny. Well, look, Mike, I'm on a level with you. Oh? I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance? Well, my... Well, say, that's interesting, Johnny. Say, let's have a little drink on that while you tell me No, about that, no, Johnny. no, thanks. <clears throat> and there isn't much to tell, except that I'm here to try to save your life, among other things. Well, no, I don't understand. I'm getting along all right. I, I've been living it up here in the Bowery for years. Maybe you were getting along okay until you took out that big insurance policy. Yeah, oh, say, wasn't that nice of Mr. Cosgrave? Now, all my life, I wanted to have some life insurance. You know, it gives you a kind of feeling of importance and security. So when he came down here one night and I told him that... Why, well, say, his eyes just lit up and he said he was going to make me a present of some insurance. Who is this Cosgrave? How much do you know about him? Oh, oh, he's wealthy. I know that much about him. He has a beautiful car and a chauffeur. Does he come down here often? Oh, now and then. Just now and then. Why? Uh, uh, now, I've often wondered about that, Johnny. So one time I asked Daddy Bill, and he said that years ago when Mr. Cosgrave was young, he came to the mission for help, and Daddy Bill gave it to him. Well, what does he do when he's here? Oh, he brings some food for the brothers. Uh, The brothers, that's what Daddy Bill calls us. And some money, and he always gives jobs to a couple of men who've drifted in here. What kind of jobs, Mike? You know, that's something I don't know. You see, they never come back here again. Maybe it's because they can't. What's that? Uh, What'd you say, Johnny? Mike, I'm going to give it to you straight. To me, the whole thing smells to high heaven. To me, this Cosgrave sounds like a racketeer. Oh, no, I may no, be no. wrong. I'll know better when I meet him. And I intend to do that as soon as possible. 
But right this minute, I bet that he comes down here for only one purpose. To recruit help for some sort of illegal job. Oh, that's a terrible thought, John. When he heard you say you'd like insurance, he jumped at the chance. And why not? Let you name him as beneficiary and then have you knocked off. Oh, no, John. That ice pick in your side was no accident, Mike. No more than the shots at you last night. But he's been so nice. Sure, of course he has. He can afford to. After all, your body's worth $50,000 to him. And that's what you're going to be, Mike, just a body. Unless I can do something about it. Oh, and such a nice man, too, really. How has he been getting this money to you? In an envelope. By mail? Usually it's just left here at the mission. By whom? Well, nobody ever seems to know. It's just a plain envelope. It's dropped in the mail. No return address? No, 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 no. But I'm sure it comes, Mr. Cosgrave. Uh, Say, come to think about it. Say, there was one due yesterday. Every Monday, you know. But Daddy Bill said it didn't arrive. Well, maybe it'll be here today. And you know something? I'd like to see it delivered. <laughs> no, you and I. You can't kid me, Johnny. You'd like to see who delivers it. <laughs> oh, say, why don't we go downstairs and wait and see? No, easy there, Mike. You're a sick man. <laughs> oh, you can't... stop talking that way, sick. Up we go. Oh, no, you can't. In all it. right. It, it, it. Here, let me give you a hand. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I'm all right. Oh, say, look at that. Look at that. Daddy Bill left my shoes here by the bed for me. Oh. Brother, now I've seen everything. I put my shoe in anything that's coming to the Ah, there. Now, there we are, all dressed. I don't know how you do it, Mike. Uh, 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 shall we go downstairs? Sure. Lead the way. All right, here. Well, the envelope should be there, because it always comes in the morning when there's nobody here. <laughs> you know, when Daddy Bill's out shopping and... Just the door to the assembly room is open for any poor lost soul who wants to come in, wait for the chow line to open. Well, we'll see. We'll see. And then we'll go to my private place. <laughs> you see, there are two things I like, Johnny. Yeah? Solitude and crowds of people. <laughs> oh, look at there, Johnny. Look at there. <laughs> There's mail there by the door. <laughs> you see? Ah. Here's my envelope. And my name's on it, too. Wait, Mike. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Ah, uh, uh, you see there, Johnny? A $20 bill. Whee! Let me have that envelope <laughs> for possible proof. Oh, yes, yes. Here you are, Johnny. Now we can go out, you and I. We can have a real... Vi- well, now, Johnny, look at that. A package for me, too. Hey, easy, Mike. Let me have that. No, 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 no. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> An infernal machine or something. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm thinking. But you didn't hear it gurgle. <laughs> oh. Well, look at there, Johnny. Well, joyous be one for you and one for me. Easy, Mike. I want to carry this one in the wrapping paper. <laughs> oh, fingerprints, huh? That's right, Mike. I'm going to take you back upstairs and lock you in your room. Uh-huh. You're to stay there. Let nobody in, not even Daddy Bill, until I get back oh, here. But Do Johnny... what I say. And just remember that I'm trying to save your life. <laughs> Item 7, 270, cab fare uptown to the 18th Precinct Station. The lab boys took over three hours while Randy Singer and I talked about cases that we'd handled together in the past. I asked him to dig up whatever he could for me on John Wesley Cosgrave, the man named as beneficiary of Mike's insurance policy. This he promised to do. Finally, a slim, intelligent-looking lieutenant walked in and handed Randy a neatly typed report of the lab's findings in connection with the liquor bottle and envelope I'd given them. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Randy? Uh, not much, I'm afraid, Johnny. Apparently, the only prints were those made by the old man and you. Proof that somebody's been pretty darn careful not to be identified. Yeah, that's what... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Seal on the bottle had been tampered with, so the lab boys opened it. That bottle contained enough wood alcohol to kill an army. Now, if that old boy drinks the way you Good said... Good Lord, Randy. See you later. Item 8, 10 bucks even. Taxi fare and tip back to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission. I don't know how the driver did it, but he skinned through practically every red light on the route. And I soundly cursed myself for having left Mike with the other bottle. The place was apparently still empty when I pounded up the stairs to the second floor in Mike's room. At least he kept his room locked as ordered. Mike! Mike! Mike, are you all right? Mike! He was stretched out on the old iron bed, his face drawn even whiter than the pillow on which his head rested. The half-empty bottle lay where he dropped it on the floor beside him. And I got a sob for the stupid, careless, unthinking way in which I... Mike! Johnny, what a hangover this is going to be. (laughs) 
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the would-be beneficiary of Indestructible Mike turns out to be a very interesting and dangerous man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Huh? What? You're John Wesley Cosgrave, aren't you? That's right. Well, my name's Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, of course. I've been expecting a call from you. Or at least from somebody like you. What's that supposed to mean? I expect you're interested in why I've insured the life of a Bowery bum for $50,000. You bet I am. I want to see you. Why not? Any time. Only it won't do you any good. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York, New York, to the Lakeside Life and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. Expense account item nine, ten cents, the phone call to John Wesley Cosgrave from my dingy little hotel on the Lower East Side. Item 10, 270, taxi uptown to see Sergeant Randy Singer, Detective Division, 18th Precinct. You get back to that glad hand rescue mission in time? After all, when the lab boys discovered that so-called whiskey was almost pure wood... By the time I got there, Randy, the poor old crude had drunk nearly half the bottle. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I better arrange for him to be hauled down to the morgue. Uh Uh-uh. Old Mike's still alive? And happy. Oh, that's impossible. You don't know the half of it. A week or so ago, somebody stabbed him with an ice pick just below the heart. Result? He said the scar itched a little bit. Two days ago, somebody drove a couple of 38 slugs through him. He said it gave him a slight twitch in his side for a few hours. Johnny, come on now. Now he goes and drinks nearly half a bottle of wood alcohol. Poison. Result? A bit of a headache. Indestructible Mike. Indestructible Mike. Where is he now? Locked up in my room at the Brakeley Hotel with orders to eat the groceries I picked up for him and to let nobody in. Good, good. But whoever is trying to get him isn't going to give up. Hey, did you dig up anything on the beneficiary of his $50,000 life policy, Cosgrave? Only enough to scare you to death. Listen to this. John Wesley Cosgrave, formerly known as John W. Gordon, John Dutchie Gordon. What? Alias Skippy Grant, alias Dutchie Smith. Wait a minute. 18 arrests, but only one conviction. Back in 1938 for possession of narcotics. Randy. Ever hear of Murder Incorporated? Well, sure, but this... Apparently they had a subsidiary. Apparently your friend Gordon or Cosgrave or whatever you like to call him was one of the big shots in it. But outside of the narcotics bit, the department was never able to really pin anything on him. But this guy's address is... Here, let me see. 621 East 49th Street. Yeah. That's not only a respectable neighborhood, but pretty plush. That's right. Well, how recent is his record? What's he doing now? Last pickup was in 1944. Numbers game and bookmaking. Charges dropped for lack of evidence. Then, apart from the record, is he still in the rackets? He is. Nobody can prove it. Like in the old days, he masterminded and let somebody else do the dirty work. It's listed here as a, quote, retired, unquote. Well, my money says he's still in business. Well, if you can prove it, the department and the DA's office will love you dearly. But I don't think you will. Every time we dragged in a stoolie who could give us what we wanted, something happened to him. Like what? Jump bail. Well, you should have known better than to let him have bail. One of them poisoned in his cell in the tombs. One breakout. His body was found in the East River. Even one suicide. Like to bet I can't tie him in with these attempts on Mike Flynn's life? Well, now, that's something else again. Uh, maybe it's uh, something we should have. No, no, hands off, and I mean All it. All right, I don't get testy about it, John. I like the old guy, and anybody who tries to hurt him has to answer to me. And somebody's tried. <laughs> Expense account item 11, 165. Cab fare to the Smart Modern Apartment Building at 621 East 49th, where the doorman announced that... Mr. J. Wesley Cosgrave was expecting me and to take the elevator to apartment 11B. Come in, Mr. Dollar. The apartment was expensively but tastefully furnished with overall carpeting that felt an inch and a half thick. Several original oils by famous contemporary artists hung on the walls. But it was the man himself who really seemed out of character with the rundown Randy had given me. He was 6'1 or 2, built like a man who spends his odd hours in the gym. 
quick gray eyes, his hair slightly gray at the temples, and his tailor was a master. Do you like it, Mr. Dollar? Huh? What? Well, that is a genuine Picasso you're looking at. And I consider myself very fortunate to possess this original by Salvatore Dali. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm sure you'll appreciate the excellent view of the city from these corner windows. Yeah. I must have the best, Mr. Dollar. Only the best. Oh, sit down, please. May I pour you a drink? No. No, thanks. I suppose you're wondering why I decided to buy old Michael Flynn the life insurance policy of which he's so proud. I am. Well, it's really very easy to explain. You see, I was born and brought up on the Lower East Side, Mr. Dollar, in deplorably poor circumstances. My early life was a never-ending struggle for survival and for whatever questionable sort of education I could glean from those about me, many of them criminals, who were my only companions. That's all very touching, Mr. Cosgrave. And I'm afraid I did little to lift myself out of the gutter until one winter night, hungry and broke, I wandered into the Helping Hand Rescue Mission. Yeah, I understand you still go around there now and then. Oh, yes, I do, in the hope that somehow I can help the poor unfortunates there the way the mission and Daddy Bill helped me repay some of the debt I feel I owe. Is that the only reason? What do you mean, is that the only reason? You've given jobs to some of those poor unfortunates from time to time, haven't you? Oh, yes, yes, I have. What kind of jobs? What business? That's hardly a concern of yours, Mr. Dollar. I've contributed much to the mission. I've tried to make life easier for some of the deserving habituaries of the mission. The... What? It's the least I can do after so much was done for me. In the case of Mike, why, his greatest desire in life was to be the proud owner of life insurance. Why, I don't know. I do. Because you sold him on it. That's a lie. That's a dirty... Is it? Then why make him name you as beneficiary instead of the mission or some other deserving cause? <sighs> that, Mr. Dowler, was his own idea. And since it made him happy, I didn't protest. I suppose the real reason for this particular desire was his feeling that it might give him dignity. That yeah, might... yeah, yeah. Now tell me something. Where does all your money come from, Dutchy? Dutch? Who told you that? Nobody calls me Dutchy no more. Not you, you're nobody else. Them days are over. I'm respectable. Even educated. I wonder. Look at my record. I haven't been on the blotter since 44, and that was a bum. Mr. Dollar, I make no pretensions about not having a past. During Prohibition and later, I made millions. Yes, millions in rum running, in the policy racket, as a betting commissioner. How about narcotics? Sure, there was hardly a caper in this town I didn't have a figure into, and I was smart. I pocketed the profits, not my boys. That's why I can afford to be retired and live decent. And I'm going to keep on living this way. You were lucky some of those boys, that mob of yours, didn't rat on you. Yeah, but thanks to a couple of convenient rub-outs that uh, I had nothing to do with, you understand. I managed to stay clean with the law. And now you're as pure as the driven snow. <laughs> Dollar, if this was the old days, you wouldn't even live long enough to regret what you're implicating, you think. Which makes me dead sure I'm thinking right. I don't know how much money you've got socked away from those old days. I don't care. But from what you've just admitted... To you, Dollar, not to any judge or DA. Right. And I'll never believe that a clever mind like yours, smart enough to keep you out of the pen... Oh, she flattery is. won't get you... No I refuse way. to believe you could turn down a chance to make a crooked buck. I don't know what kind of jobs you sent out those poor suckers from the mission on, but the fact they never came back makes that look pretty bad. You can't And along came it. Mike Flynn, poor old alcoholic Mike. Where the talk of insurance came from, I don't know, but it was too good to pass up. Insure his life for 50,000 bucks, have him name you as beneficiary, give him a few dollars so he could spend his last days in a happy alcoholic haze... Then rub him out and collect the 50 G. Listen, Dollar, if Mike gets knocked off, neither you nor anybody else is going to be able to tab me with it. And one other thing. Yeah, what's that? As a friendly piece of advice, if I was you, I wouldn't even try. Is that a threat? Oh, Mr. Dollar, you've made a miserable host of me. Come, let me pour you a drink, the finest 25-year-old scotch. And we can talk of pleasant things. For some reason or other, I did have the drink with him. But he knew what was in the back of my mind, and I'm afraid I knew what was in the back of his. Something along the same line as a couple of convenient rub-outs. Once or twice, his veneer of education slipped, but all in all, he made a fair conversationalist. Finally, I left. And all the way down to the street, I kept wanting to look back to see if I was being followed. Somehow, somewhere, there was a way to get this, Cosgrave. But I could see it would have to be through someone else, someone working for him. 
And whoever that might be could very well be out to get me first. Or Mike. Item 12, 295, taxi back to the Brakeley Hotel, where I hoped the old boy was still locked up in my room. He was. Oh, well, Johnny. <laughs> my, my, I was beginning to wonder what had happened to you. Oh, hey, 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 hey. What, what was the matter with that food I left with you? You hardly touched oh, it. Oh, I had enough. I had, it was kind of dry, though. Kind of dry. There's a container of coffee there. Yes, but coffee just doesn't seem to quench my thirst. Oh. You should let me bring the rest of that bottle along. That wood alcohol? Any more of that would have killed you. Oh, gee, I did have a kick, though, didn't I? <laughs> oh, I don't know how you lived through it. Well, look, now I want some lunch. And, Mike, I'm going to take you along with me. Oh, that'll be fine. Could I have maybe a little drink, too? Oh, sure, you can have one. Oh, that's nice. Good. Of course, the size of the drinks they serve nowadays. Oh, no, just one now. Come on. Oh, that's fine. One will be... Uh, see, oh, there's a lovely saloon just around the corner, you know. Come on. Even sandwiches for those that want them, I understand. Good. Oh, 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 these stairs. Maybe we could just bring a bottle back with us to your room if we are going to come back. Sweet, funny old soul. I loved him. And I knew that without me, he'd be a dead one so fast. So far, the attempts on his life had been made by persons unknown. Unless the mission, Daddy Bill. Could Daddy Bill be somehow tied in with Cosgrave's operations? I wondered. I paid the check. That's item 13 and we started walking to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission along some of the back streets... I wanted time to think it out, if I could think, over the incessant, yes, pleasant sir, shadow of I'm life. really enjoying life now that I have money now and then. Why, sometimes I get on the subway and I just ride all over town all day long. Yeah, yeah, you told me. See, why don't you try that sometime, John? It's really one... See, there's a bar there on the corner. Why don't we just... Oh, no, in? no, let's pass that one. John, why do you feel that you have to look after me this way? You know darn well why I... Hey, watch the curve, why I'm looking after you. It's because somebody's on... Mike, look out! Mike, Mike, listen to me. Hey, Can you hear me, Mike? The... Hey, mister, oh. get a cop, an ambulance. You mean for him or what's left of him? Yes, hurry. Well, what's the matter with you? Use your eyes, buddy. It's too late. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, somebody's going to have to pay for what's happening here. Yes, that's a promise. From yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this phone number you left for me to call. Are you at Bellevue Hospital? Yeah, Randy. What's wrong? Are you at headquarters? Yeah. A truck ran over Mike Flynn, and I'm sure it was deliberate. But he's alive, I hope. He was four hours ago when I dragged him in here. Indestructible, Mike. I'm not so sure this time. What about that truck? Did you get the license? Yeah, the boys at the first precinct are working on it. Check with them, will you, while I stay here at the hospital? Sure, Johnny. And one other thing. Yeah? Find out how long that Glad Hand rescue mission has been in existence. The place where old Mike's been living? Yeah. Why? I don't know, yet. But do it, will you? Sure, and you let me know when Mike's out of danger, huh? Johnny? Better pray a little bit, Randy. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York, New York, to the Lakeside Life and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. The veneer of class and education assumed by J. Wesley Cosgrave just wasn't thick enough to hide the fact that he was better known a few years ago as Dutchie Gordon. And to the old-time racketeer, it looked like a cinch. Pick up a Bowery bum like Mike Flynn. Insure his life for 50 grand. Give him a few weeks of high living. Then knock him off and collect the insurance. Yeah, real cinch. Especially for Cosgrave, who'd learned as far back as the early days of Prohibition how to employ hired thugs to do the dirty work, while he sat back and collected the profits. I knew as surely as I'm sitting here that Cosgrave was behind the knifing, the shooting, and now this accident to old Mike. But how to prove it? Yeah, sitting here in the waiting room of the hospital, waiting, 
waiting for some word of Mike's condition. Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes, Doc. Can I see him now? Very shortly, I believe. Oh, how, how is he? Is he There's going? a phone call for you at the floor desk. Oh. This way, please. Thanks. But how is Mike? Doc, how is uh, he? You'll be able to see him shortly. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Ah, Mr. Dollar, I was quite sure that you'd be there at the hospital. This is J. Wesley Cosgrave. What made you think that? Why, because of the accident to Michael Jeremiah Flynn. How did you know about it? I kept it out of the papers. I find it helpful to know about a lot of things that don't get into the papers. Well, your boy goofed, Cosgrave. Mike is still alive. My boy? You know as well as I do, Dutchie, that one of your mob was at the wheel of that truck that ran him down. You better keep your yap shut, Dollar, or I... I, uh... I thought I made it plain to you earlier that I no longer have any connection with the doings of the, uh, shall we say, underworld. Oh, sure, sure. As for poor old Mike, I understand it was an accident, a very unfortunate... Knock it off, Cosgrave. I was there when it happened. Oh? Yeah. Pretty stupid of a would-be killer to try that with an investigator right next to Mike, wasn't it? Did you see the driver of the truck? Suppose I did. You say he wasn't one of your boys, so what difference would it make to you? Why, none. None at all. Did you see him? Why don't you worry about that for a while? Again, I waited. Sat and waited. And paced the corridor of the hospital. Outside, the sun sank slowly behind the horizon of skyscrapers, and the busy clamor of the day's traffic segued to the softer, muffled, but still busy traffic hum of night. And I waited. And smoked. And waited. Finally, it must have been close to midnight... The nurse led me quietly down the hall and indicated the private room that I'd had set aside for Mike. After a brief instruction about not staying too long, she pushed open the door for me and she tiptoed away. And there, lo and behold, in all his glory, his head swathed in bandages but wearing a smile a mile wide, sat indestructible Mike. Hi there, Johnny. Mike! <laughs> oh, Mike. You old reprobate. Yeah. I guess there is something in prayer after all. Uh, how about this, Johnny? Isn't this swell? Isn't this the finest place you ever saw? Oh, Mike, you're going to be okay, aren't you? Going to be? <laughs> yeah, I am now. But I guess I had those doctors scared. Oh, my, 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 Johnny. You just should have seen the way they fluttered around. All. And those nurses, Johnny. I never saw such beautiful ladies in all my life. And so nice. And doesn't it smell good in here? The disinfectant they use in here is much nicer than Daddy Bill has at the mission. And you know something? I haven't seen a single bed bug. Not even a cockroach. Oh, no, Mike. Mike, I'm so glad to see you in one piece. Oh, sure I am. But an old bum hasn't any right in a pretty place like this. You had no more business living through that accident than... Oh, Johnny, how you talk. Yeah, yeah, and you mustn't talk so much. No matter how good you feel, you need rest. Time to heal up whatever got broken. Broke? Oh, me? Well, you still need rest and quiet. Here, I'll turn off this light. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you in the morning. Oh, but, uh, Johnny. Yeah? Johnny, how can I just sleep? Oh, too much pain, huh? Want the nurse to give you a hypo? Oh, they fill me up with more needles than you ever saw, but there's only one real painkiller, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I'll see you later. If the administration of Bellevue Hospital ever found out that I was back in Mike's room a few minutes later, and why, they'd probably have my neck. But I, I didn't leave the whole bottle with him, I swear it. Only about three fingers in his water tumbler. And the blissful expression on his face as he closed his eyes to sleep made me sure I'd done right. Item 15180, taxi back to my dingy little hotel. And I thanked whatever gods may be that old Mike had pulled through. He'd been right. They just couldn't seem to kill him. So far. But I knew they wouldn't give up. Not with $50,000 at stake. 50000 more to line the pockets of Dutchy Gordon, who I was sure was just as much of a racketeer as ever, despite his present name of J. Wesley Cosgrave and his pretense of gentility. Because his henchmen had always feared to squeal or died violently before they could, the police had nothing on him. My job was to find one of the mob, make him sing. But how? I guess I was still thinking or dreaming about it when my phone rang the next morning. Hello? Jerry Dollar. This is Jerry Dollar. Hello? Oh. 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 Uh. 
Johnny Dollar. Hey, you still in bed? Mm-hmm. Oh, Randy. Yeah, I thought you were going to call me. Is he still alive? He sure was when I last saw him at about midnight. Well, that's a miracle after what that truck did to him. And say, yeah. uh, the boys downtown found that truck. Yeah? Yeah, it had been stolen and was abandoned. Did they find any prints on it? Plenty. Whose? Lefty Skillman. Well, have they picked yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They found him all right, tied up in a sack floating in the East River. Old-time gangster style. Oh, so help me. I knew that when Cosgrave found out... You say out... Uh, Mike's going to be okay? Randy, he was sitting up in bed perky as a cockatoo. No. I don't know how he does it. Why, he was all ready to pack up and go back to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission. Huh? Felt he didn't deserve to be in such a nice, clean place as the hospital. <laughs> Bless his foolish heart. Did you find out anything for me about that flop house? Yeah, that's what I called you about. Uh, but you still haven't told me... Well, what'd you find? Uh, well, according to the records, the building was put up in uh, 1901. As a mission? As a piano store, 1901 to 1906. Uh, real respectable place. Then? Well, that section began to degenerate. 1906 to 18 was a cheap grocery store. 18 from 1956? From eight, 1918 to 22 was a second-hand clothing store. And a speakeasy till 1929. Keep going, Randy. Well, I guess the Depression knocked that out, because next it was a saloon. How long? Let's see, uh, 1944. That's when William Grover Larkin took over the lease. Daddy Bell. Yeah, that's I right. I knew it, Randy, I knew it. Yeah, what? Dutchie Gordon, alias J. Wesley Cosgrave, told me that he'd got a hand from that mission when he was just a kid. Hmm? That would have meant 25, 30 years ago, at least. Yeah, it's only been a mission for 12, but... Hey, wait a minute. The lease on that property, when it was a speakeasy, it was in the name of Larkin, too. Add one more fact, Randolph, and you see what I'm getting at. What's that? Your own police files show Cosgrave was still in the rackets in 44. Yeah, but on a charge that we couldn't substantiate. Right. Tie him up. Cosgrave was a rum runner during Prohibition. Daddy Bill ran the speak for him since 1944. Whoa, 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 now, boy. You're trying to build a case on purely circumstantial evidence. All right, but I think I can make it stick. Now, listen. Where does Cosgrave get the thugs for whatever job he's pulling now? If he is. Of course he is. And he gets them out of that flop house. The boys he gives jobs to that are never seen again, remember? Maybe it does tie up. Oh, you bet your sweet life it does. At least I'm going to tie it up. No, 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 take it easy, Johnny. Just how are you going to go about it? Well, the first thing I'm going to... Well, hold it. Huh? Well, what's the matter? Somebody outside the door of this room, I think. Hold on, Randy. Yeah, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Johnny. All right, what do you think you're doing? Oh, Johnny, hello, hello! Whoever hit me with whatever he hit me with wasn't fooling me. In the second before I passed out, I vaguely remember hearing a voice, the voice of the room clerk, shouting at whoever it was, and the sound of footsteps running away. Then blackness, and a dark, heavy throbbing in my head. Then after a long time, another familiar voice. It was Randy, I think. Dimly, somewhere along the line, I could see figures bending over me, hear the voice again. Then more darkness and the weird sounds in my brain. Other sounds, too, that seemed familiar and seemed meaningless, 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 meaningless. Finally, after an eternity of jumbled sounds and shadows, a cold, bright light pierced into my slowly returning consciousness. And momentarily, I could see a man in white. And women and... Yeah, yeah, a hospital. These were the doctor and the nurses. I tried to speak to them. I couldn't. But slowly a realization of what had happened came to my muddled mind. Randy on the telephone had heard the attack on me and had brought help. An ambulance had brought me here. For a brief moment I saw the glint of a needle poised above my arm. Then blackness again. But a soft, quiet, peaceful blackness. Johnny. Johnny. Mm. Johnny. Oh, wow. Well, what are you? <laughs> Johnny. Oh. That's the boy. Oh. Wake up. Huh? Mike? <laughs> That's right. Isn't it nice they put you in the same room oh. with me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mike. Your policeman friend, Sergeant. Mm. And he told me something, Johnny. And he's right. Mm. You've got to be careful. They're out to get you, too. Now, here's...
here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, old Mike may have been indestructible, but I knew by now that I wasn't. So tomorrow the wind-up. It had to be while I was still alive. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Randy Singer, Johnny. How you feeling? Thanks to you and having got me here pretty good. Bellevue's a good hospital. I'll be released within the hour. So will Mike Flynn. And? I'm going down to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission to straighten out a few things with Daddy Bill. Sounds to me like it ought to be police business, Johnny. I'll be right over. No, no. Let me handle this alone. You got your gun? You bet your sweet life I have. Johnny? I'll report to you later. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York City, to the Lakeside Life and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. Item 16, 190, cab fare for Mike Flynn and myself. Bellevue Hospital to the dingy Hotel Brakeley. Both of us had our heads still swathed in bandages. With the help of the room clerk, I installed Mike in a small room on the fifth floor with instructions to keep his door locked. In my own room, room 203, I picked up my 38 and donned the old clothes I'd bought. Item 17, 55 cents, taxi to the neighborhood of the Glad Hand Rescue Mission. For obvious reasons, I walked the last couple of blocks. When I got there, the big front assembly room was empty. So was the soup kitchen in the back of the place. I called Daddy Bill's name a couple of times and got no answer. And finally decided to wait for him in the little room back of the assembly hall that he used for an office. I still felt a little shaky from the blow on the head, so I didn't mind just sitting a while. But I left the door open a crack, and a few minutes later heard the street door open. It wasn't Daddy Bill, but I recognized him as a newcomer to the mission whom I'd seen on my first visit. He made directly for the little office. All ready, Daddy. Uh, oh, why, you ain't Daddy Bill, sir. No. Do you know where he is? Yeah, out shopping. At least that's where he said he was going. Didn't I see you in here the other day? Why, yes, sir, I guess you did. Uh, my name's Emery. I just read the rods in from Ohio. <laughs> Boy, I had to. I got myself in a jam back there that... Yeah, I guess I just got me too much muscle. <laughs> uh, but they won't catch up with me here. Daddy Bill promised me that. Say, I should have known you wasn't him in here. Oh? Sure, he said he wouldn't be back for another hour. You plan to wait for him? Sure do. He promised me a job. I would money on it. Enough money, he said, to get clear out of the country. And he'd help me do it. Doesn't it strike you funny, bud, that a guy running a place like this would help you skip the country? Man, when you're like me and you get a helping hand, you just don't ask no questions. Uh, you see Mike? Mike Flynn? Yeah, he come back? No, why? Uh, Daddy Bill left me a package for him. For him or Johnny if they come back here. Well, uh, I'm Johnny. Well, here, I'll get it. It's right outside the door here. Yes, sir, liquor, he said. And uh, maybe you let me have some. Here, see? I'll take it. Liquor, did you say? That's what he said. Let's open, huh? No, no, hands off. Well, look here, man. Old Mike always shares his stuff with Lefty Skillman. Lefty Skillman. It was Lefty who'd run us down with a truck whose body was found in the river. Lefty, one of Daddy Bill's poor unfortunates here at the mission. Things were beginning to add up. And this package left for Mike and me. Liquor, he said. But it didn't gurgle. Emery, listen to me. Sure, Johnny, but Forget not. this package. I'm taking it with me back to the Waldorf. Waldorf? Yeah, that's right. That's where I'm staying. Don't let these clothes fool you. I thought there was something funny about you, the way you talk so fine. You a dick... Never mind. If Dandy Bill wants me, that's where I'll be. Old Mikey won't find, because I got him in room 203 at the Brakeley Hotel. Room 203? Forget it. He's still recovering from that accident. Shouldn't be disturbed. He's all doped up anyway. That's why I took him to the Brakeley, where nobody will find him. Yeah, room I said, forget about that room 203. 
If Daddy Bill wants me, tell him to call me at the Waldorf. Item 18, 10 cents. Phone call from a booth in the street to Sergeant Randy Singer. Item 19, five bucks even for a fast but gentle taxi ride to the 18th Precinct, where Randy had promised to have the lab boys alerted for me. Uh, is this it, Johnny? Yeah, and handle it softly, please. Okay, okay. You gonna stick around? No, till I'm going back to the Brakeley to, uh, to make sure Mike is all right. Yeah, now look here, Johnny. Call the Waldorf for me. Get me registered there. Instruct the desk that if there are any calls for me, I'm eating lunch or something, and I'll be back in my room in, say, an hour. Right. Do it. I'll see you later. <laughs> Item 19, taxi back to the Brakeley Hotel, to the service entrance in the alley. For five bucks, the freight elevator operator swore he'd tell no one he'd see me take the back stairs to room 203, my room, not Mike's, as I told Emery at the mission. Office? Room clerk? That's right. This is Johnny Dollar in 203. Oh, yes. Are you still working on Now, listen, case? listen carefully. If the police call me, put them through. Very well. But to anyone else who calls or comes looking for me, I'm not here. I never was here. You never heard of me, understand? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Dollar. We've worked with police and private investigators before. Okay, but if anybody wants to know about Mike Flynn, I want... Flynn? Yeah, the old bum I had you put in the room up on the fifth floor. Oh, yes. If anybody course. asks for him, tell him he's in this room, 203. Oh, very well. You sure you got that straight? Yes, sir. <laughs> Time was on my side, I hoped. Emery back at the mission had said Daddy Bill wouldn't return for an hour, but I couldn't be sure. As quickly as I could, I spilled a half bottle of whiskey around the room in the hope it would give the effect old Mike was there. Then I pulled down all the shades and drew the drapes tight across the windows. I turned down the bed and must up the covers so it would be ready for me. My watch said I still had time to kill, so I ran upstairs to Mike's room on the fifth and carrying a fifth. Well, bless my soul, Johnny. And look what you've brought me. On one condition, Mike. Oh, oh yes. Oh, anything you saw. You've been so good to me. I want you to promise that no matter what happens, you'll stay right here in this room until I come back. Why, of course, Johnny. Of course, anything you say. Especially now that you brought me this bottle of, to kind of keep me company. Say, wouldn't you like a little nip before you go? No, no, thanks. Oh, and keep this door locked. Oh, now you sure you wouldn't like just one little no. bit? No. Oh, I hate to think of me having it all alone when you probably need it as much as I do. Now, oh, oh say, Johnny. Yeah? When are you and I going to be able to take these awful-looking bandages off our heads? We'll talk about that later. i got to get back to my room. Yeah, now, you sure I can't tempt I'm you? I'm sure. Yeah. Now lock this door. But if you decide you want a little nip with me... Quickly and quietly, I went back downstairs to 203 and cautiously let myself in, leaving the door unlocked. Nobody had been there. I'd made it in time. But now all I could do was wait. Here, Randy. Better make it fast. Oh, what's the matter? What'd you call about? That pretty little package you dropped off for the lab, lads? Yeah? <laughs> you sure were right about it. A bomb, huh? If you or Mike had opened that package by now, you'd be spread all over the island in tiny little pieces. Look, Johnny, come on, let me in on it, huh? What are you up to down there? I'll tell you when it's all over. That is, if what I think is going to happen does happen. You sure you don't want some help? No, I think I can... Gotta go. I'd heard footsteps out in the hall. Quickly, I slid into the bed, leaving nothing but my heavily bandaged head showing. The footsteps passed. And then, far down the corridor, I heard a door open and close. I lay still and waited. And lying there, thinking, I began to wonder if I'd been right in turning down Randy's offer of help. Yet how could he help with them? Footsteps again. And this time, they stopped outside my door. It's all clear out here in the hall. That voice was Daddy Bill's, and he wasn't alone. Mike? Mike? You want on the light? Mike? Oh, he's in here all right. Smell that booze? He's there on the bed, asleep. You mean drunk? Close door. Hey, see him? Dead to the world. Are you sure this is going to be safe, Dutchie? Why do you suppose I took so long to case the jury? Yeah, but what about Dollar? I told you, Bill, at the Waldorf. You sure? You talked to him? No, no, he was in the coffee shop. Now, shut up, get this over with. Yes. Always we do the dirty work for you. All right, this one I'll do myself. Well, who's... Shut up. Johnny! Oh, Johnny. Wait a minute, that's Mike. And who's on that bed? Shut up. All right, Dollar. 
He can get up out of that bed and take it in the chest or lay there and get it in the back. All right, Cosgrave. Touchy. Both hands up high. Drop that gun. Sure. Johnny. Shut him up out there, Bill. Yeah, Daddy Bill. Shut quiet, Dollar. You'd better do something, Cosgrave. Or you'll have two witnesses. The man who always kept his skirts clean, huh? Quiet. Bill, let him in. We'll knock them both off. Make it look like a fight between them. Something. No, no, wait. Boss, we... Johnny, is something... To... I'm coming in. Oh, no, you get no, back. I... Randy. Hey, you're real rough, aren't you? Now, wait a minute there, Mike. Get up off his chest. I want to see what your dear friend Daddy Bill looks like. What'd you hit him with, anyway? Oh, dear. The poor bottle's all broken. Best thing could happen to you, Mike. Ah. Well, this is Dutchie Gordon, alias J. Wesley Cosgrave. He won't be for long. What? Well, what's that, Daddy Bill? You feeling better? He always hung it on somebody else. Uh, what are you talking about? Left, he shortly, all of them. This one, he'd have hung on me. Well, not this time. That gun! Look out! Thanks! Put it down! Oh. Randy? Cosgrave, dead as a doornail. And when Daddy Bill comes to after that sock on the chin, you can tell him he's cooked his own goose. My, 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 my. The world will be a bit better without Dutchie Gordon, alias J. Wesley Cosgrave. And of course, the courts will take care of Daddy Bill Larkin. Plenty. Mike? Indestructible Mike? Well, he'll probably outlive the rest of us. I hope I can get down to see him now and then. Talk over our great adventure together. Expense account total, eleven hundred twenty-six fifty, which is a lot less than the fifty thousand you might have had to pay off on Mike. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week. The heady romance of moonlight on a lonely beach in Mexico. Moonlight from a killer's moon. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this story. Heard in this week's cast were Howard McNair, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Herb Vigran, Alan Reed, and Roy Glenn. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>